Thank you for joining us for the Victory Podcast today. Today's podcast is from July 21st, 2019. Join us as we continue our study on the life of Joseph with Pastor Dax. Hebrews chapter 11 is, uh, don't have to turn there, but it's, it's that famous chapter. It's a well-known chapter, Hebrews 11. That, that is called sometimes the Hall of Faith, right? That has these great, uh, all these great examples and heroes of the faith who um, had these kind of epic moments of the faith, or sometimes it just seemed like fairly normal moments of the faith, but they're selected by the author of Hebrews as an example of faith. And I want you to listen to the moment that the author of Hebrews selects from the life of Jacob. It's in Hebrews 11, verse 21. And it says, By faith Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. Isn't that interesting? I mean, of all the events in Jacob's life, this is what is chosen as the great display of his faith. Now, now we're going to see in the next chapter, next week in chapter 49, that Jacob blesses way more people than just Joseph's sons. So what's so, what's so great about this blessing? And we need to recall Hebrews 11, chapter 1, where faith is defined. It says there that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And, and that verse really describes Jacob's perspective while he's in Egypt. And we started to see that last week. God is blessing Jacob's family in that place, right? But at the same time, Jacob recognizes that God has something better, this promised land. And as Jacob looks forward to God fulfilling his promise of this better place, Hebrews 11 uses a moment in this story on his deathbed as an example for us because Jacob's mindset is the same mindset that Christians should have. And that is that even though we as Christians might experience blessing and prosperity in this world, in this life, we understand at the same time that this world, as it currently exists in its sinfulness and in its brokenness, it is not our hope. It is not our home. And that is, that's the big idea for this morning, that the life of faith that God instills in his people is characterized by a future hope in a promised land. Let me say that again. This is our big idea this morning. The life of faith that God instills in his people is characterized by a future hope in a promised land. That's true for Jacob, as we'll see. It's true for us. Because we live in a day where many people believe that being a Christian means that you're living your best life now. That, that Jesus is a nice option. He's a nice add-on to your life that can help you achieve your potential and maybe even realize the American dream. That's not Christianity. Christianity involves a life of faith that God instills in his people and that faith is characterized by a future hope in a promised land. This world in its current state is not our home. Now that doesn't mean that right now, right here isn't important. It is. It's just not all that there is. If you're only living for right now, you don't have any assurance that you have a future hope in a promised land with God. And so the life of faith that God instills in his people is characterized by a future hope in a promised land. And we're going to see that in three ways in this passage this morning. Number one, that this hope is pursued practically. Number two, that this hope is cultivated generationally. And number three, that this hope is empowered theologically. So let's look first here at how this hope is pursued practically. And we're actually going to back up into chapter 47. This is where we ended last week, and we're going to look at verses 27 through 31 uh, to help us see this. So 47, 27 says, thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they gained possessions in it and were fruitful and multiplied greatly. 
And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were 147 years. Now, from a worldly perspective, Jacob, Israel, had every reason to be satisfied with settling in the land of Egypt. They'd been given the best of the land, right? Goshen. And they were able to be there, not only in the best of the land, but they were separate from the Egyptians in that land. So they were able to live and worship as they wanted to do. They were prospering in every way imaginable. Remember, they'd been given charge over Pharaoh's livestock. And as the famine progressed, Pharaoh's livestock became the livestock of the nation. Things were good. God was blessing them greatly. And Jacob, he comes down and he lives there in this land of Goshen for 17 years, and he experiences all of this prosperity and blessing. And by the way, just as a side note, I love that Jacob gets 17 years on the back end of his life to go with the 17 years that he had with Jacob, or with Joseph, sorry, at the beginning. I think that's just a a beautiful picture there of God's kindness. But we see here now the first of three death scenes deathbed scenes of Jacob. And it's, it's stretched out over these three chapters here. Pretty unusual. Uh, pick that up in verse 29. And when the time drew near that Israel must die, that's Jacob, he called his son Joseph and said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. He answered, I will do as you have said. And he said, swear to me. And he swore to him. Then Israel bowed himself upon the head of his bed. This is the moment that the author of Hebrews picks here as the highlight of Jacob's faith. Because as much as God had been blessing his family in Egypt... Jacob remembers God's promise of a better land, a better place. He had told him that he will bring his descendants back to that place, to Canaan. But the question here is, so then why does it really matter if Jacob is buried in the family tomb that Abraham had purchased all those years earlier? And this is Jacob's very practical way of standing on God's promises, of believing what God had said. He wants his body to lie in the land where God would one day bring the Israelites, and he wants to do that as an act of faith. It's an action, a practical action that he is taking that points to a future hope in a promised land. I mean, as Christians, can we really say that we have a future hope in a promised land if our actions never line up with our words? Jacob's actions here demonstrates what he believes. He he doesn't just believe that God has a special place for his family one day. He wants to be buried there. And when Joseph swears to him that he will do it, Jacob worships God right there from his deathbed. In in the book of James, chapter 2, we're warned that faith without works is dead. So if we say we have faith in a future hope, our actions should demonstrate that. What does that look like for you practically? Well, one example might be that because our hope lies in a future promised land, we don't treasure the things of this world. Right? Whether God has given you a lot or God has given you a little, if you are a believer, you will use generously whatever God has given you to serve God and to bless others. So that's that's one thing I want you asking yourself as you leave this place today, is how are you practically demonstrating your faith? And, And that's point one. The hope that God gives us for a future promised land is pursued practically. And we see that demonstrated here in Jacob's dying wishes. Point number two, the hope that God gives us for a future promised land is cultivated generationally. It's cultivated generationally. Look at chapter 48, verse one. It says, after this, so after this deathbed scene that we just saw here previously, probably not too much time has passed. After this, Joseph was told, behold, your father is ill. So he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, And it was told to Jacob, 
your son Joseph has come to you. Then Israel summoned his strength and sat up in bed. Jacob's time on this earth is growing short, and so Joseph travels back to the land of Goshen with his two sons to see him one last time. Do you remember these two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim? The last time we saw them was way back in chapter 41 when they were born, and uh, we were told, uh, it was explained to us what their names meant. And if you remember, they were born before the famine began. And so if we do the math here, Jacob came down to Egypt two years into the famine, and now as he's dying, it's been 17 years since that, so Joseph is around 56 years old at this point, and these two sons are in their early 20s. Okay, so this is not a picture of, of two little boys being carried in to say goodbye to grandpa one last time here. These are grown men. They are aware of the gravity of the moment. And so Jacob's told that they've arrived, and so this 147-year-old man on his deathbed summons all of the strength that he has to sit up and speak with his favored son and his two grandsons. So this is a, a big moment. But this is not just about saying goodbye for Jacob, right? Because when they'd last seen each other, those verses that we just read, Jacob made Joseph swear to bury him in the land of Canaan. And as soon as they step into the room, that's what Jacob starts talking about again, the land of Canaan. He says in verse 3, And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make of you a company of peoples and will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. So this, this point of time that Jacob's talking about here, it's interesting because he's referring back to an earlier time in his life when he'd left the promised land and God had promised to bring him back safely. And now here on his deathbed at the end of his life, he's outside the promised land again. And as he reflects back on that earlier experience, he's reminding himself now of God's promise to bring him back again. Because he knows even as his family has prospered in Egypt, this is not what God has promised. And notice there he speaks of God Almighty, El Shaddai, God Almighty, the God who is powerful enough not just to make promises, but to be able to back them up. And, and these words that he speaks there about fruitful and multiply, a company of peoples, a land, offspring, those words go all the way back to God's covenant with Abraham. So, so this is bigger than just Jacob, right? God has been working in this family for generations now. This family that is going to one day become a nation and one day dwell in this promised land. But Jacob's concerned with, with more than just his burial in the land of Canaan and his family safely returning to the land one day. He makes this kind of really abrupt transition right there in verse 5. Notice it. Kind of out of the blue. And now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine. Interesting, he names the younger and then the older. They shall be mine as Reuben and Simeon are, his two firstborn sons. And the children that you fathered after them shall be yours. They shall be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. So all of a sudden he turns his thoughts towards Ephraim and Manasseh. He wants to declare to these two young men who had only ever known Egypt that they are Hebrews, that their hope lies in a land that God has promised, one that they've never seen. And again, as Christians, we too, who have only ever known life in this world, our hope lies in a land that God has promised us, even though we've never seen it. And it's based on God's promises to those who came before us promises that we can see in his word so that we can have a confident future hope in a promised land. But here Jacob claims Joseph's two boys, Ephraim and Manasseh, as his own. He, he makes them equal in status to his own two firstborn sons. And, and what's happening there when he does that is that in not so many words, 
Joseph is receiving the double inheritance of the firstborn son. It's not given to him directly, but by Jacob adopting his two sons as his own, Joseph's family receives the firstborn double portion of the inheritance. So this is a tremendous blessing for, for both Joseph and for his sons. But do you see how faith is such a reality for Jacob in this promise that he makes to Ephraim and Manasseh? Because even when Jacob lived in the land of Canaan, he was a sojourner, right? He was a wanderer. The only property that his family owned was the land with the cave that Abraham had purchased as a tomb. That's all he actually possesses in Canaan when he makes this promise to bring Ephraim and Manasseh into the inheritance. So it's as he's blessing his grandsons, at the same time he is believing that God is going to keep his promise to give him the whole land so that he in turn can make this promise of the whole land to his sons and to his two grandsons. He's cultivating this faith generationally, you see. And as believers, as people who've been adopted into God's family, we have to do the same thing. We have to seek to pass on our faith to our children, to our grandchildren, so that they too will look beyond the things of this world, the things they've only known, and look ahead to the things promised by God. We, we need desperately, I think, in the church, this same kind of generational perspective. If, if you're here and you're a parent or you're a grandparent and you're only thinking about your own faith, that's short-sighted. You need to ask yourself, what kind of spiritual inheritance are you leaving for your family? And that, that extends beyond just bringing your kids to church on Sunday morning. Now, I'm glad that you do that. Okay, that's certainly beneficial. But your children aren't going to develop an eternal focus from just spending an hour or two here every week, are they? All week long, your life is preaching something to your children about what matters. Now, you might say to your kids, hey, yes, we believe in heaven. We believe in God. We don't lay up treasures in this life. We value God over everything. He is our priority. But what message does your life actually preach? Do your kids see a parent who is more in, interested in their job for the sake of getting stuff? Do your kids see a parent who is more consumed with hobbies and recreation than service and sacrifice? Do your kids see a parent who is too busy or distracted to interact with them in the middle of their daily activities? Or do they see a parent who sits down regularly with them and says, this is who God is. This is how God is at the center of this moment. This is why the gospel means something to us. This is what God has done in my life. Son, daughter, grandson, granddaughter, you need to be walking with God in your life too. That, that has to be our mindset. So don't miss those opportunities to produce generational fruit. So Jacob speaks of God's appearance to him at Luz, or he later changed the name of the place to Bethel. He speaks of God appearing to him there, and he, then he speaks about his desire to ad adopt Joseph's two sons as his own, bringing them into all of the covenant blessings that had been promised to him by God. And then, again, we get some kind of seemingly out of place words here in verse 7. Jacob continues, he says, As for me, when I came from Paddan, to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan on the way when there was still some distance to go to Ephrath, and I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. So where does this come from here? What's he talking about? Well, if you remember, you can go back and look at this later in uh, Genesis 35. After God appeared to Jacob at Luz or Bethel, and, and renewed the covenant with him there. That, that's what he just spoke about in verses 3 and 4. The very next recorded event in Genesis 35 is the death and burial of Rachel. 
So I think that's probably why he mentions this now. These things happened uh, very close to each other. And his mind is already on Canaan. And the son of the only woman that he ever truly loved is right there in front of him. And he remembers, he flashes back to this scene of her death and her burial, not in the family cave that they owned, but along the roadside. And he doesn't appear to be bitter here. He had a great loss, but it seems that God's consolation was sufficient for Jacob in this moment. And then he asks an interesting question in verse 8. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, who are these? Now, it's possible that this is just kind of the honest question of an aging blind man. Uh, But I think it's probably more of an invitation for Joseph to formally introduce the boys here in this very formal occasion of the blessing. We we sort of do this sometimes when we speak uh, to the parent of a child. The child's there with the parent and we say, now who's this? Right? We know who the child is, but we're inviting them into the conversation. We're acknowledging their presence when we say that. I think this is kind of what's going on. And Joseph said to his father, they are my sons whom God has given me here. And Joseph always has that perspective, doesn't he? These are my sons whom God has given me here. Even their names reflected that uh, Joseph saw his sons as a gift from God. Remember that? And he said, Jacob said, bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now, these blessings, this is not just going to be, you know, a bunch of empty words here, just a bunch of platitudes, best wishes. In this culture, in this age, a paternal blessing from the deathbed, it's a big deal. It's significant on its own. But in this family, in particular, the weight of Almighty God is behind these blessings. So this is a moment of tremendous significance and honor. Verse 10 Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. And of course, there's a little bit of irony there, right? As we think back to how Jacob tricked his father Isaac, who himself couldn't see when he stole the blessing from Esau. So Joseph brought them near him and he kissed them and embraced them. So this is a very touching and emotional moment. And we see that here in verse 11. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face And behold, God has let me see your offspring also. And as Jacob is there with his son and his son's sons, we're reminded that the faith that God instills in his people is pursued practically and it's cultivated generationally. But also, finally now, this faith is empowered theologically. So watch the scene unfold here as Jacob begins to bless Ephraim and Manasseh. Verse 12. Then Joseph removed them from his knees. They weren't sitting on his knees, right? They're in their 20s. But they were probably uh, bowing before Jacob out of respect. And now he, he helps them up and positions them for the blessing. And he, Joseph, bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand, toward Israel's right hand, and he brought them near him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. So Joseph helps his blind father out. He steers the boys to the proper place so they can receive the blessing. But then it's not at all what Joseph is expecting, and, and we'll get into that more next week, how Uh, Jacob ends up crossing his hands there and pronounces the first blessing on the younger son. But for now, I want you to just listen to the blessing that Jacob declares over these two boys. Verse 15. And he blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys. And in them, let my name be carried on and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So this blessing here, it takes place in three parts. So first, Jacob prays that the God of his fathers will bless Ephraim and Manasseh. When he refers to God as the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, that points to God's ongoing presence with him and his family. God had been with him 
through every twist, every turn. No part of his life had been lived away from God's presence or God's purposes. And then he continues on to describe God as the God who has been my shepherd all my life long. So it's it's not that God was just present in his life as sort of an observer, but that God was faithful and cared for him. He shepherded him. And Jacob knew what that meant, right? Jacob himself had been a shepherd all of his life. He knows what it means to care for a flock of sheep. And in calling God his shepherd, he's saying that he's like a sheep that God has tended. And as you think about Jacob's life, you don't have to think very hard or very long to see all of the ways that Jacob had tried to screw that up, to make a mess of it. But God had been with him through it all. And Jacob knows that. Every event of his life has been filtered through the sovereign hand of this shepherd God. And then he says also that God is the angel who has redeemed me from all evil. Now, God had delivered him from some evils, but in every case, no evil happened to Jacob that was outside of God's control. And that had been the case over and over again in Jacob's life. And in many of those experiences with Jacob, God's work had been demonstrated by an angelic presence. Think about this. When he, when he fled from Esau, he had that vision where he saw angels ascending and descending on that stairway going to heaven. And when he fled from uh, Rachel's father Laban, God shows up and speaks to Laban at night through an angel to warn him not to act against Jacob. And then when he returned back to Canaan, when he was all scared about running into Esau, he was fearing for his life, he wrestles all night with this mysterious man. Remember God in some kind of pre-incarnate form. He's experienced God's shepherding presence in his life, delivering him from evil. And so in this prayer, in this blessing, he, he recounts these great theological truths about who God is and how that's affected his life. This is the God whom my grandfather and father walked with. He is present with me. This is the God who has been my shepherd for my entire life. This is the God who has redeemed me from all evil. He knew that God was with him and for him. And that's really good for Jacob. What about us? Friends, can I submit to you that we... Christians have an even greater assurance of God's faithful presence than the possibility of an an angel showing up now or then. A believer has been made a new creation in Christ Jesus, and you have experienced an incredible gift of God's continual presence within you as his spirit indwells you and leads you. So often we look look back and we think, oh, if we could have had this experience or that experience and we fail to remember that we have been given something much more. And so after this kind of opening prayer of this blessing, Jacob makes a statement here in verse 16 of formal adoption of these two boys. He says, bless the boys and in them let my name be carried on and the name of my father's Abraham and Isaac. So this is Jacob acting on the promise that he had made to Joseph back up in verses 5 and 6. It's, it's because of this formal adoption into Jacob's family that Ephraim and Manasseh become the fathers of two of the tribes of Israel and are given territory in the promised land. And then Jacob c- concludes his blessing here with, this, uh, with these words. He says, let them grow into a multitude of in the midst of the earth. And again, that is part of the original blessing given to Abraham, where God promised to make him a great nation. It's a promise that's repeated to Isaac after Abraham's death. It's a promise that's been repeated to Jacob. And now Jacob repeats it himself to these boys. And we're going to look in a little more detail at that next week. But I hope that for now, at least, you've seen that the life of faith that God instills in his people is characterized by a future hope in a promised land. That's what Jacob's perspective has been. And it's been demonstrated practically by how he lives, even by how he dies. It's something that he wants to pass on to his kids and his grandkids. And it's a hope that has been based totally on God and what he has done. 
Jacob's not counting on his own ability to get the family back to Canaan. He bases everything on the hand of Almighty God who has been with him all his life. And that's what he wants to tell his grandsons on his deathbed. This is how God has been to me through my life, and this God is your God. And that causes us to return back to Hebrews where we started out this morning because ultimately it's not about the strength of Jacob's faith on display in this passage. And it's not about the strength of your faith or my faith. It's about the one in whom our faith is in and his strength. And so as we look at the kind of faith that we are called to, if we're honest with ourselves, we recognize how far short we've fallen of that standard because none of us have lived perfectly in response to this God that we've just heard about, have we? Which is why as Hebrews chapter 11 ends, after having recounted all these stories of all these people who had spectacular moments and demonstrations of faith, we're called not to primarily look at them, but to look at the only one whose perfect faith matters for our salvation. Regardless of how well we have or haven't lived, it's not about the achievement of our faith. And so Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says this. This is right after Hebrews 11. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Here we go. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. It's not about Jacob earning his righteousness by some kind of perfect faith. It's not about us earning our eternal inheritance by our perfect life of faith. It's about looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, the only one who has ever lived that faith out perfectly, even in how he died. And we find our rest in his accomplishments, in his righteousness, in his sufficient sacrifice, in his resurrection, and in his promise to return. And so we lay aside the weight and entanglement of sin. We forsake that. We turn from that. And we turn toward Jesus, placing our trust and our hope in the one who lived a perfect life of faith. So let's not just be encouraged by Jacob here, but let us worship the one so much greater than Jacob. The life of faith that God instills in his people is characterized by a future hope in a promised land. So let us now together pursue that hope practically. Let us cultivate that hope generationally. And may we look to the God who loves us to empower that hope theologically. We would like to thank you for joining us for the Victory Podcast today. This podcast is a ministry of Victory Baptist Church in Hermiston, Oregon. You can find us at 193 East Main Street in Hermiston, Oregon, 97838, or on the web at yourvictory.org.